Hey everybody, this is Birch. Uh, a couple days ago, weeks ago, some point, there was a video called uh, Can DC Recover? So I got a mail from a viewer here. This is a really, really short mail. It says, uh, hey Perch, I enjoyed the way you thought through the question of DC can recover and regain its past glory. I suspect your answer is probably going to be the same, but can you do the same assessment of Marvel? So, uh, so, so generally the answer is still the same because the, the key point in this is that if you get a hot run, if you get a hot creator, and yes, that takes management wanting to do that, um, one of the biggest factors, you know, at DC, which some people pointed out, uh, one of the creator pointed out, which I, I won't name by name, but um, is, is there, um, is that, you know, if you're making changes, and they're making vast changes every four months, and the management and kind of the direction, all that kind of stuff, if that's what you're doing, then your odds of, of facilitating a creative environment or a, a, you know, a product that people can really rally behind is close to zero. Regardless of who's there, you could, you could take the absolute just legends of comics editorial, whatever your feelings were on Jim Shooter. Jim Shooter, uh, during his tenure as editor in chief at Marvel, did run a very effective shop in getting their product, you know, to grow. I, that that you know, again, you could you could hate the man, you could love the man, but the indisputable facts are, and they are indisputable because there's actually numbers, there's there's dollars, financials under Jim Shooter's watch, things went up. Now, was that all because of Jim Shooter? Of course not. It was, in fact, it was mostly because of the people who worked on those books. But how did those people get to work on those books? Well, because the management prioritized what they were doing, set a direction, put them in the best you know, position to succeed, and there you go. That's, um, that, that's just, just it. That's how it is. Um, so in general, yeah, things can get better, but it's, it's, the conditions have to be right for it. And the biggest barrier is not ideology. It is lack of long-term thinking. It is every four months, we're going to make a radical change. We're going to disrupt the business. Eventually, whether you're you know, creative or not, that beats you down. That gets you to a point where, I mean, I, you know, if you can't plan for the future, then why plan at all? And then that, then very suddenly, that starts to show up in the work, particularly creative work. So I say that because in a little bit, my answer for Marvel is a little bit different from DC. Um, although those, those basics still do apply that, you know, Hey, get some good people in there. be fine. But Marvel has one, I think, challenge that's different from DC. And I think harder to deal with than DC, which is Marvel has really embraced a, uh, a world of, um, let's call it imper Im 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 per permanence impermanence? Anyway, um, Marvel has a direction, I think, largely stemmed from their parent company, Disney, and also from, uh, you know, the movies and the success there, where none of the comics, the editorial direction, none of the comics are really intended to have any long-term direction at all, ever. Now, you may say it's a little bit harsh, uh, but, but if you look at the books, if you look at the publishing strategy, the company is is entirely willing to reboot their line for no reason, you know, very flimsy reasons. When I say reboot their line, I mean go back to a number one issue, not truly reboot, but but actually renumber, take runs that may be strong and powerful, and then without letting them breathe, without letting uh, you know thought to sink in, maybe make some money off the trades, you know, they will immediately completely shift the status quo, do something entirely different. Look at Al Ewing's Hulk that he did. And then a month, less than, I think, three weeks later, you know, we, we dove into Donny Cates' Hulk. Complete and utter little to tonal shift between the two. And whether you like Donny Cates, you like Al Ewing, you hate one or both of those people, it, was, it, it sent a message which was, hey, there's this run. And the Immortal Hulk under Ewing was, I would say, it's a celebrated run, or at least a... Uh, you know, a comic that had a lot of strong critical acclaim. People thought it was it was it was good. It's doing different things with the character than you know what people were used to, and it 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 had a cult following. It it rose its audience over time. Um, but despite that, despite uh, you know what could be a decent amount of money in an omnibus and trades, and the fact they kind of stumbled onto something that seemed to have some long term 
positive views from you know their their customers they said well you know the the run has come to an end so we're we're slamming out another comic three weeks later we're going to have donny cates donny cates is going to come in and do the whole starship hulk thing with the uh bruce banner driving him you know kind of with the middle construct and everything else completely different than the the body horror type approach that ewing was doing now there's nothing wrong with changing direction giving somebody something new that that's not bad it's the speed and complete, you know, throw it away one day, pick it up the next kind of behavior that Marvel has a lot of. You know, right now, and maybe this is just hope talking, um, the Krakoa era of X-Men was a massive status quo, not just for the X-Men, the entire Marvel Universe and everything. Right now, they're feeling like the, uh, you know, the tie-ins and the additional comics they will put out, and they can put out something like an Exterminator's book, and it's still going to pick up 42,000 or so uh, buys. It, it's, it's selling well enough not to mess with it. If those numbers trend into the 30s, they're going to, you know, one day the Krakoa era will be over, and it will be unceremoniously over. It'll be like, right, doing something different now. Forget all that stuff. Moving on. And unfortunately, for comic collectors, people who, you know, read comics over time, and this is Marvel and DC's bread and butter, far more than the indies. For those people, the idea of, nah, forget what you just knew, we're moving on, is hard. <laughs> Clearly, as you can see in the comments, it's, it is a big reason, and I think the biggest reason, why people are objecting to Tim Drake being bisexual or gay. They're doing that because they, they, they were... You know, they had many, many years of a different status quo, and then it changed. And it gets, I think the distraction people get into is like, well, they're angry because they're, they're bigots. They're angry because he's gay. And it doesn't, you know, help that a lot of the people who are objecting will say things like, I don't want more gay. But what's really going on for a lot of people under the surface is, hey, you changed this thing in a very fundamental way that conflicts with what I've seen before. Bobby Drake had a, had a girlfriend, had to fight to the death. Uh, and it was, was chased girls for a long time, kind of immature. That's, um, you know, to go, Hey, that was just him kind of trying to, you know, hide how he truly felt and everything else. I, again, you could, you could tell that story and you can ultimately win people over. And definitely there's less people irritated today about Bobby Drake being gay than there was a couple of years ago, but all the same, you know, collectors like this kind of long-term, you know, continuity. And if you're Marvel, you're sending a lot of signals right now that it doesn't matter. You know, does this run suck? Don't worry. That person will go off of it. We're going to reboot it. New number one. Miles Morales just ended by Saladin Ahmed. Um, I was struck by one thing, very small thing. They made a big deal, meaning Marvel and Saladin, about changing Miles' costume. Now, I thought the new costume was awful, and several of the people who drew it just, it looked absurd, kind of, it looked like, uh, you know, what, Mushmouth from Fat Albert, <laughs> whatever, it, it just, it looked, it, it looked it, I thought it was a terrible costume design, but still, they went through the effort of doing it, in part because they were trying to separate Miles from Peter Parker and give him his own identity, and I think that, that that's certainly a worthy task, but um, Saladin finishes his comic run, he just ended it, and the last page of the comic is a Stay tuned for Miles Morales number one. Miles Morales Spider-Man number one coming in December. So, you know, at least they're going to wait two months before they vomit out another number one. But the thing that struck me is what's on the cover? Oh, his old costume, the black and red one, i.e. the one you see in the movies. And this is where a lot of this is coming from. The movies, the cinematic universe, cartoon, Disney+, Plus, everything, they go in a direction and the comics are like, ah, yeah, we got to, uh, uh, shit, we got to change things. Marvel was clearly happy trolling the fans, and I do think it was trolling them, with a uh, big, bulky, angry She-Hulk. You know, you know, uh, ugly She-Hulk, as they said. And then Marvel's like, hey, we're doing a She-Hulk show. And I said video, by the way, I said, I, there's a video of me saying this, and there's comments that is another one of those, I told you so. But I said in the in the video that, I guarantee you this She-Hulk show is not going to feature ugly Rage Hulk. It's going to feature the John Byrne, uh, Dan Slott, Charles Soleil uh, She-Hulk. That's the She-Hulk it's going to portray. 
breaking the third wall. And it was funny because there's a lot of comments that are like, oh, poor pathetic Birch. You don't understand. The SJWs are going to use it in an attempt to de degrade, you know, the female form and everything else. Now, the She-Hulk show has plenty of problems. But if you notice, they've leaned in a lot to, you know, the, uh, well, as my daughter says, but dunk and dunk humor. Um, they, you know, they, they're a lot of that show is about her appearance, body, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And the yes, feminist stuff too, but, but it is, of course they were going to do that. And I think the comics have kind of resigned themselves to the fact of, well, the movie guys will decide something and then, you know, we'll just have to change everything around. So who really cares? It doesn't matter to, for Marvel to succeed, for Marvel to get, you know, dramatically better per your question, they're going to have to figure out an answer for that something better than what they're currently doing. They're going to have to figure out how to deal with it because right now they're, um, they're failing in that regard. Um, when you send a message to your customers, to your fans that nothing really matters, then, you know, that that's a tough one to overcome. Anyway, thanks for the question. Let me know if you agree with my uh, thoughts in the comments below and thanks for listening.